If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. I don't want to take a long time this morning, but I want to speak both to those of you that are the boot camp graduates, because this is a very special sort of divine inflection point in your life, but I also want to speak to all the rest of us, because in many ways, what the boot camp students and graduates are living through in a very vivid and intense way is something that all of us are living in our own ways. Because whether or not we are called into full-time evangelistic ministry like some of these graduates, or we are called to serve the Lord in secular spheres of influence, all of us are called to be kingdom representatives. Isn't that true? I think one of the greatest lies that the enemy, that the enemy ever foisted onto the church was to convince the people of God that the work of the ministry was to be done by that tiny fraction of people that's called into full-time ministry that we call the clergy. And the rest we call the laity and they are just told to sit down and be quiet and be good spectators. But that is never the way that this thing was designed from the very beginning. When it was arranged by Jesus, you read about it in Ephesians 4, that five-fold office of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they were always designed to equip the church, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So all of us are on the team, amen? There are no spectators. There are no bystanders. In fact, if anything, those of us called into full-time ministry, those evan- apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, if this were compared to a football team, their job would be the water boys serving the team that's out on the field playing and making sure that they stay refreshed, amen? And so I wanna speak to you from the life of Elijah and Elisha, this is the story where Elijah is taken into heaven in a whirlwind and he passes the mantle of his ministry over to his young protege, Elisha. Let's read this in verse one. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. Let's just pray for a moment, can we? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the way that you constantly speak to us in the ways that we need to be led and guided. Father, I pray that this morning you would do that again, that you would speak to us by your spirit, that you would infuse us with wisdom, that you would edify us and prepare us for the journey ahead. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. I remember when my um, firstborn son, Elijah, was just a little kid. Clarify, that's my son, not the Elijah in the Bible. That can get confusing when you're reading the same story. But he was, he was probably four or five years old. It couldn't have been any older than that. And he was staying with his grandparents and they pastored a little church. They, let, they lived in a parsonage next to the church. And it was a weekday, and so they took him over to the sanctuary. The sanctuary was empty. And you know this little four or five-year-old kid jumped up onto the platform and grabbed a microphone. And of course, that was adorable, so everybody was encouraging him to preach. And so this has become kind of a, a legendary story in our family because what he decided to step forward and say was incredibly profound coming out of the mouth of a four or five year old. And this is what he began to preach, only five words over and over again. He said, there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. Just a five word sermon that actually is incredibly profound and incredibly important for us all. And that's what I wanna preach to you about this morning. I wanna talk about a price that there is to pay. You know, we used to sing a song, Jesus Paid It All. You know that song? Jesus paid it all, you know it? All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And that is really true. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to our salvation, there is nothing that we bring to the equation. There's nothing that we add to it. Jesus paid for everything. By grace you have been saved by faith. It is not anything to do with your works. You have no right to boast about it at all. It's 100% bought and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. But once you've been saved, my friends, 
It's gonna cost you everything. Salvation is free, but following Jesus costs everything. And in fact, the deeper your discipleship becomes, the greater the price there is to pay. The more you want to do for God, the more effective that you want to be in his kingdom, the greater the price is going to be. The more God uses you, the more God anoints you, the more God blesses you, the greater the price is to pay. And I mean, you can just look at the 12 disciples of Jesus for a great example of this. These guys, every single one of them who followed Christ in that very extreme and remarkable way, every one of them paid the ultimate price. Their very lives were laid down as martyrs because of their discipleship. But it wasn't just their martyrdom that was a price. I mean, they paid a price in so many different ways. They were persecuted even before they were killed. They were misunderstood. Imagine following a man that some people believed was a, a charlatan. Imagine b following a man who many people believed was taking you away from your Jewish heritage. They lost friends and they lost loved ones. They had to leave places that they loved and people that they loved behind. They had to travel around the world and preach the gospel because that's what Jesus told them to do. I'm sure they were often physically tired and hungry, maybe even sick, maybe even lonely at times. They surely forfeited many comforts and conveniences for the sake of the gospel. And can you imagine the kind of spiritual warfare that they had to endure? I mean, if you think that the enemy attacks you, imagine what it would be like if you were Peter, the apostle, I'll tell you what, there was a big target on his back and the enemy, I'm sure, was after him every day. There's a price to pay. And in the story from 1 Kings, we read about Elisha, who was, again, this young protege. He received the mantle of Elijah. This didn't happen all at once. There were certainly several stages to this transition, but I wanna talk to you about three of those stages of transition, of receiving that mantle that are relevant for us here today. But first, I need to just help you to understand what the mantle of Elijah represented because, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion about mantles, especially in the charismatic world. There's a lot of nonsense. Some people think that the anointing is like a mantle that you can get if somebody just lays hands on you and prays for you. You have people running around to conferences collecting mantles. If you pray for me, I'll get your mantle. And not only will I get your mantle, but I'll get the mantle of the person that prayed for you and the person that prayed for them. So you have people collecting mantles like baseball cards. And I've heard people say, yeah, I've got the mantle of Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake and Catherine Kuhlman and John Wesley, and yet they haven't led a single person to the Lord, but they've got this whole collection of mantles that they're able to brag about because somebody laid hands on them. My friends, listen, that's not what mantles are. Actually, a mantle, maybe we misunderstand this because this is not an article of clothing that we often wear in modern times, but it was really just a cloak that would, you would put on the outside of your outfit, kind of like an overcoat, to add an extra layer of warmth. And of course, because it was the outermost layer, it was the thing that people recognized you by. And of course, in those days, they didn't have department stores, they didn't have Dillard's, they didn't have Macy's. So clothes were a lot more hard to come by back then, and people wore basically the same outfit all the time. So you almost became synonymous and identified by the clothes that you wore. So imagine Elisha, or Elijah, the prophet, wore this cloak around his shoulders, and if you saw him coming from a distance, you would see that cloak before you saw anything else, and you would say, the prophet is on his way. So now Elisha, Elijah is about to be taken away in a whirlwind, and Elisha knows that something is going to happen because Elijah told him so. So here's the first stage, is that Elisha sought the mantle. Everybody say, Elisha sought the mantle. Those of you that are boot camp graduates, that is what you have done. You have sought, not Daniel Kalenda's anointing, not something to collect and hang on the wall, but that mantle was a symbol of the office and the responsibility and the calling that had been on Elijah. And I want you to understand something, that if God calls you to do something, it is not then a matter of just sitting back in your recliner and waiting for it to manifest in your living room. You have got to get up and seek that mantle. 
You've got to go after that which God has called you to do. Not just by getting hands laid upon you, but by following Christ. It's called discipleship. And so, here's one interesting thing that we read about here in that very first verse of 2 Kings chapter two. Elijah told Elisha, stay here, in verses two and in verse six. And both times, Elisha responded in the same way. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. And it was a long journey. When they left Gilgal, Bethel was about seven miles away. Before they left, Elijah said to Elisha, why don't you stay here and rest? And then they left Bethel, and Jericho was another 12 miles away. But before they depart, Elijah says, why don't you stay here and rest? And then when they left Jericho, Jordan was another six miles away. Before they continued, Elijah said, why don't you stay here and rest? That's the third time. And as the day wore on, as the miles grew longer and longer, each offer of rest was probably more compelling than the one before. But each time, Elisha responded in the same way. As the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. Can I tell you something that to take the mantle requires a kind of intensity of resolve that says, I will not give up on this. No matter how long the road gets, no matter how arduous the journey becomes, I'm going to continue to seek after that which God has called me to. Can you say amen? You know, we live in a time, I'm trying to watch my time here. I wish I could go off on some of this stuff. We're, we're living in an age when, <laughs> when people want everything handed to them. And we're living in a time where people have no, how do I say this? There's very little grit. People can't take criticism. People, people can't take correction. People can't take anything that's not just positive affirmation and accolades. Sometimes what we, what we need is actually the opposite of the thing that we want. And this was what makes it very difficult in ministry because sometimes what you as a leader are supposed to be doing for those who you lead is the opposite of the thing that you, they want you to do for them. And then when you do what you're supposed to do as a leader, you actually get resistance instead of appreciation. I mean, imagine how Elijah must have felt when time after time after time, Elijah keeps saying to him, why don't you just stay here? Why don't you just stay here and rest? I mean, at some point, it might have even seemed hurtful to Elijah. Elisha. But don't you believe in me? Don't you think I'm capable of this? And yet it was a test that Elisha needed to endure because if he wasn't able to endure those tests from his mentor, there was no way he was going to be able to walk in his shoes and carry his mantle. I've got to keep moving here. So the first stage was that Elisha persevered through all the dangers, toils, and snares. Step two was that Elisha seized the mantle. Look here at verse 11. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha saw him no more, and he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He saw it lying there. Imagine the scene. Elijah, is now, Elijah, the old prophet, is now gone. And Elisha looks and sees his cloak, his mantle lying on the ground. And he has a choice now. He can either pick it up and put it on his own shoulders, or he can walk away. And it might seem obvious that Elisha would pick up the mantle, but you have to understand that there was a cost associated with picking up that mantle. Because whoever picks up that mantle is the one who is now responsible to demonstrate the power of God. The one who picks up that mantle is now the one who is expected to speak on behalf of God. And of course, Elisha had been around for a long time. He'd seen the kind of target that Elijah had been, not only for critics, but for the king and for Jezebel and for the devil, for all the powers of hell targeting him. Maybe this is the reason that Elijah gave Elisha so many opportunities to bail because Elijah was trying to say to this young man, look, this is a lot tougher than it looks. This is a lot more painful than you realize. There is a price to pay to walk in this authority. 
that you've never even dreamt of. And he gave him one opportunity to quit. He gave him another opportunity and another opportunity and another opportunity. But the real test came when that mantle was lying there. And now Elisha had to make the decision, do I turn around and walk away from this thing and live a happy, peaceful, (laughs) drama-free life? Or do I pick that thing up and put it on my shoulders? And you know what he did. He picked it up. He put it on. And it wasn't even before he got back down to the bottom of the mountain that the trouble began. (laughs) If you read the story, you know that those sons of the prophets, those colleagues of Elisha's, were automatically jealous and they had it out for him from day one. The moment they saw him walking with that cloak, I bet it was a red cape like a target for a bull. The moment they saw it, he became the target and he was that target for the rest of his life. Look at what happens. Read, we're gonna read verse four here. So Elisha's coming down the hill. He takes the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. And this is what he said, where now is the Lord? The God of Elijah, he asked. And then he struck the water and it divided to the right and the left and he crossed over. Now, I told you before that mantle was a sign of Elijah's position and authority. It was a a symbol that had now been passed down to Elisha, his protege. And here's what could have happened. Elisha could have just taken that mantle and he could have worn the mantle for the rest of his life. He would have been well off as the president of Elijah's Bible school for the prophets. He would have had a prestigious and respectable career. He could have played it safe. But he would have never shaken the nation. And his exploits would not be biblical. When Elisha got to the water of the Jordan, he had to make another choice. This time it was the choice to keep that nice new mantle neat and clean or to use it and get it dirty. Man, you know, he he probably looked sharp. This was was a brand new piece of clothes and Elijah was no slob. It might have been the nicest piece of clothing that Elisha had ever worn. When he put it on, he felt like a million bucks. Then he gets down to the river and it's just sitting there, not parting for him just because he had a mantle on his shoulders. Can I tell you something? Just because you've graduated from the the boot camp, the devil's not gonna bow to you when you walk past. Your your, Your bank account's not automatically gonna be filled with money. All the sicknesses in Orlando are not automatically gonna be healed. You're not gonna get automatic invitations to the White House now. Oh yes, you graduated, but that's the beginning, not the end. So Elisha could have just called for a boat to come pick him up and take him across to the other side of the Jordan because not only would striking the water risk ruining his mantle, what happens if the water doesn't part? Then he's actually ruined his reputation. So in that moment, Elisha is faced with a choice. Do I protect my mantle? Do I protect my reputation? Do I protect my office? Do I protect my position? Or do I take a risk and do something by faith that will put all of this to the test? And here is my challenge to you boot camp graduates. Now you are in a moment of time where you have seen God provide for you and bring you to a Jordan River moment, now what will you do? Will you wear that mantle, that diploma, like a badge of honor to hang on the wall, or will you get your hands dirty? Will you take some risks? Will you put yourself, heart and soul, into this harvest for the sake of the kingdom of God? Look, to do it that way risks embarrassment. It even risks failure. Can I tell you something? I've had quite a few failures. Can I tell you something else? Even. Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke had quite a few failures. You know, Reinhard used to tell the story of how his ministry developed. And of course, he had this incredible breakthrough in his first crusade in Gaborones in Botswana. And then he began to travel around doing these crusades. This was way back in the 70s. And the way Reinhard tells the story, he says, you know, there was 10,000 people. 
And then he went to the next city and there was 30,000 people. Then he went to the next city and there was 50,000 people. And then the next city, there was 100,000 people. And then 500,000. And then 1 million, 1.2 million, 1.6 million. He tells the story like that. I said to him one time, Reinhardt, I don't think you should tell the story that way. And he said, why not? I said, because what a lot of people don't realize is that you're just, you're talking about the peaks. Like looking across a mountain range, seeing peak after peak after peak. And what a lot of people don't realize is that there were a lot of valleys in between. And those valleys are what makes or breaks a man. Not the mountaintops. The valleys are where the people quit. The valleys are where people throw in the towel. The valleys are where people become offended, become disillusioned, become resentful. That's the part that you've got to endure as a man or a woman of God. Reinhardt's great crusade in Botswana, let me tell you what happened in the next crusade. He went to another stadium in another city, and he was the sound man, he was the tech man, he was the preacher. It started to rain in the middle of the meeting and the power went out, so he had to go restart the generator. So he got down off the platform in the middle of the sermon to go restart the generators, and when he stepped on the mud, he slipped and fell face first into the mud and he was covered from head to toe in mud. He restarted the generators and had to get back up on the platform and finish his sermon covered in mud. You didn't know that one, did you? But are you willing to get your mantle dirty? Are you willing to get your hands dirty? Are you willing to take a risk? Are you willing to bleed? Are you willing to sweat? Are you willing to weep? Are you willing to sacrifice and go? That is the call of the mantle. It's not just a nice piece of clothing to be worn. It is a calling. Because of time, I've got to get to the outcome. Here's the last stage, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 15. The company of the prophets from Jericho, when they were watching, they saw the water divide, and they said, the spirit of Elijah is resting upon Elisha. And they went out to meet him, and they bowed on the ground to him. After all of that time, after all the difficulties... Elisha was finally vindicated by the Lord himself. I remember, sorry for telling all these old stories. It just shows that I'm getting old. But I remember when I'd first taken over for Evangelist Bonky, we'd been preaching together in the Crusades for only a couple years probably by that point. And I went to meet him one night right before the service. We would always pray together before we went to the meeting. And he said, Daniel, the Lord spoke to me as I was praying. And he said that he is going to establish you. He is going to establish you. Not me. Not our marketing team. The Lord will establish you. And I saw how the Lord did that over years. Through miracles and breakthroughs and victories and trials and perseverance and difficulty and danger. The Lord established me, I will say to you, the Lord will establish you. He's going to establish you with signs and wonders and miracles. He's going to establish you with patience and long suffering and character and fruit of the spirit. He's going to establish you with provision, financial provision and every other kind of provision that you need. He's going to establish you with supernatural protection against whatever the devil throws at you. You might be the devil's prime target for attack, but you are going to be his prime target for protection. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And most of all, evangelists, I speak to you especially at this moment, he's going to establish you with a harvest of souls that will be your legacy. From now on, you are a soul winner. You are a man or a woman of God. You are an ambassador of Christ. And my favorite, you are an evangelist. Maybe you're not one of the boot camp graduates. I want to say to you that this applies. Wherever you are, the Lord himself will establish you. The Lord himself will watch over you. But here is the key. Take that mantle. Put it on your shoulders, but don't just wear it. Get it dirty for the sake of the kingdom of God. 
and you will see the power of God in action. Can you say amen? Can we stand together this morning? I'm gonna hand it back over to the worship team, but here's what I'd like for us to do. I wanna just pray for you. And then if you would like prayer, I, I feel like, I, I'm telling you, I'm not, you, you see there's kind of an emotional thing happening with me. It's not because I'm getting nostalgic. I sense the presence of the Lord. That's the only thing that makes me react this way. And I feel like the Lord is calling to some of you. He wants to mark you today. He wants to mark you for the rest of your lives, for your future ministry, for that which he has called you to do. Some of you feel that attack that I've been talking about, the onslaught of hell coming against you. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's your business. I believe that this morning, the Lord is gonna raise up a standard against the enemy coming in like a flood. He's gonna surround you with a, with a wall of thorns, a fence of thorns. He's gonna keep that enemy out, even though he prowls like a roaring lion. Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And we wanna pray for you today too. So I'm gonna be in the altars laying hands on anyone that wants prayer. But for all of us, let's just lift our hands. Father, I thank you for the mantle that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, callings and anointings that have been designed for us since before the foundation of the world. Lord, when you were knitting us together in our mother's womb, you had a mantle for us to wear. Not as a decoration, but as a calling. Lord, give us faith, give us courage. I sense the Lord saying, I'm, there's somebody that he is, he's asked you even this week to take a step of faith and it's very, very risky for you. And you, you stand to possibly lose everything if you obey. You're like Elijah standing at the Jordan River with a mantle in your hands. You can keep it looking pretty or you can take a risk. The Lord says, hit that water. I love the way that Elijah said it. He looked up to heaven and he said, where is the Lord? the God of Elijah, because he knew that if his life was going to count, he was gonna need more than Elijah's mantle. He was going to need to grab a hold of Elijah's God. Oh God, we look to you. We need you this morning. And Lord, we cry out to you in our own way, in our own situations, whatever they might be. Lord, would you show up? Would you make your glory known? Would you manifest your presence? In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. If you want prayer, please come forward. Worship team, would you lead us?